welcome to the DeFi podcast, where we discuss all things DeFi. We host in-depth discussions with industry leaders with a focus on the Avalanche ecosystem. The content of this podcast is for informational purposes only. Statements made by hosts or guests reflect their own beliefs and opinions and is not investment advice. The host or guest may have personal investments in any assets being discussed. Hey everyone, welcome to the DeFi podcast. Introducing the different hosts. First, welcoming Jared, the $15 million man. We call him that because he's once thrown away 300 Bitcoins. That's how early he was to the game. Hey Jared. Good day. Jared is also a senior analyst at Google Next on Rhett, the Elon Musk of crypto, boat founder of Gravita and Avant. <laughs> and we'll see how many more protocols in the future. Hey Rhett, how are you feeling? Hi, good. How are we liking the nickname? Not so much, yeah? <laughs> You do drive a Tesla, right? I do drive a Tesla, and I would not say that I'm at a level of impact that's sufficient for that title. Maybe we just call you the, the, the young Elon Musk of crypto. And uh, finally, Bill, representing the VC element, head of Daybreak Digital. Hey, Bill, how are you feeling? Hey, how are you doing? And for the record, I'm going to say with confidence that Rhett knows a lot more about crypto than Elon Musk does. Oh, well, that's for sure. And finally, myself, uh, I'm Jeff. I'm the head of DeFi at Pool and advisor to Avant. So this week, we're going to talk about a few topics, yen carry trade, destroying sort of all risk assets. We're going to talk about a Solana video that came out last week, but we're going to start with Chokepoint 2.0 which has been happening for a while. I think we know that it's real. And the Democrats are trying to run a pro-crypto campaign currently, as we've all seen. Yet, this seems to always be an, an active campaign. It's a trap. It's a trap. Yeah, I mean, Bob Balaji had a great tweet on this. He, he basically said, like, look, if their policy shift is real, they have to show that it's real. And they can't just hold Zoom meetings and, and put out tweets and talk to people. Like, they actually have to do something. His tweet said something like they essentially were able to get President Biden to step down. So if they want to get Gary Gensler to step down, like they can do that. So they I forget exactly what the other demands he had were, but like, you know, firing Gary Gensler, stopping a lot of the SEC enforcement actions. There was some talk recently about taxing unrealized capital gains above some certain threshold, like eliminating that. There's a number of things that the politicians can actually do right now rather than just talking about doing it. And if they, you know, if they're serious about a crypto pivot and if they don't do those things, then they're not serious. You know, his whole point was make them actually expend the political capital now. Don't wait for them to deliver those things later because they won't. I think that's a really good point. <clears throat> On choke point specifically, kind of what's been happening for a few years, legal participants in the crypto industry in the US are being debanked, both individuals and companies. One of the big ones was Hayden Adams, the founder of Uniswap, really above board, awesome player for no reason, got debanked. So there was this recent Zoom call where this was brought up as an issue and the Democrats said, oh, we're not doing that. And then someone said, hey, everyone in the room who's been debanked, raise your hand. And it was almost every single crypto person on the call. So it's obviously happening. So totally agree with you, Bill, that it's like, Admit it's happening and say you're committed to stop it. That and then also fire Gary or at least call for his departure. Like if Kamala even just said, I'm not a fan of Gary, he should step down or we should get rid of him. Even that would be pretty nice. But yeah, I agree that like there needs to be some actual like demonstration. Right now there has been none and Kamala hasn't yet really said anything at all about policy. So I'm hopeful that that changes. But yeah, so far we have the still very anti-crypto people of Elizabeth Warren, and then we have some that are just like, it's ambiguous. So I'd love to see that ambiguity go away. I think what's to stop them from taking a sudden pro-crypto stance and then doing kind of a bait and switch where they just institute a CBDC or FedNow or something like that, right? So it's like... We're bringing you crypto, but it's not the crypto that you want. Scary. It seems to me that like a lot of people, I feel like we've made this point maybe on a past pod, but a lot of people are conflicted because they, they may have liberal values, which is maybe why they're into DeFi. And they, they sort of want to vote for this party, but this party has been very obviously negative towards crypto. And it's the criticism. I think it's a bit sort of tough to run on a pro crypto campaign 
and they've sort of trapped themselves in, right? Because you're in power. So stop making promises. You're in power. You can, you can make these changes now. If you were able to get Biden to walk away, yeah, obviously you can get other people to walk away or you can get Biden to sort of run your agenda the way you want it run, right? Yeah, 100%. And on the other side, you have the Donald Trump meme coin I guess, fake meme coin drama that happened this week. I mean, I just remember that I logged into crypto Twitter and someone was talking about a meme coin for, what was it called? What was the name of the meme coin? I forget the ticker, but it had started a few hours ago and, and had jumped up to like a hundred million in valuation in just a few hours. It's like, okay, I'm not buying. And then like one hour later, the whole thing went to zero. But I guess the big, the reason why it caught my eye is because I, I won't name names, but some serious people on crypto Twitter, people with huge followings and like heads of protocol were supporting it kind of ambiguously. So there was some chance it was like the real Trump meme coin and ended up not being. So it was one of the few times I saw a meme coin relatively early and didn't have too much FOMO because it crashed pretty early. Rhett, did you say someone at least tweeted that they lost $7 million on this thing? There was a guy who said he lost his entire net worth, which was seven mil going into, I think the token was RTR. But then the way that he was talking on Twitter seemed too casual for someone who just lost their entire multi-million dollar net worth. So I think it was a, a troll tweet, I hope. Like that would be very sad for that person to lose that kind of money. But yeah, there was that claim floating around. One thing that was interesting was that Eric Trump tweeted, and I think he has like 3 million followers or something after this whole thing ended. He tweeted that the official Trump meme coin hasn't come out yet. And when it does, you will hear it here first. I guess hear it here first means from his Twitter account, I guess. But question for you guys, if they were to launch an official Trump meme coin from like one of the direct family members, where do you think you could get to? How high does a Trump meme coin official, or it doesn't have to be Trump. It could be a Kamala meme coin too, like an official one. How high could this thing go? 100 million? 1 billion? More? Oh, it could probably reach the billions. I mean, if we look at meme coins like Cardano and Ripple, I mean, meme coins can easily reach in the top 10. Or Doge. That's a real coin. The most successful recent celeb coin, I think is Mother from Iggy. And it's, it's what, like 50, 60 million TVO or 50 to 60 million in fully diluted value. So maybe into the hundreds, maybe billions. It'd be interesting. Trump's a polarizing person. So I wonder, do a bunch of Trump fans buy it and others stay away from it? So it has more of a ceiling than something like Pepe or Shib or Doge? I don't know. I think you can also look at it from from the perspective that if they're planning to do this, they're probably planning to do it way ahead of time. And they're most likely going to put a lot of money behind it very early. So it becomes very successful, or at least appears to become very successful early on. And, you know, could just be a really good sort of cash grab. I, I kind of view all of these sort of like official attempts into crypto to basically just be a cash grab. One of the Trumps also posted and he said something like, I recently fell in love with crypto and DeFi, get ready for a big announcement. And the fact he specifically called out DeFi, I don't know, maybe their main coin will have some DeFi integrated application or something, which I think could give it more potential upside if it had something more unique and interesting about it. Who knows? That's pure speculation. I guess my question is, uh, is this good for crypto? Uh, is this good for DeFi? Um, and I guess it's, the sort of old thought about any publicity is, is good publicity. I'm not sure. Experimentation is good. You know, as long as people aren't being lied to about what it is, I, I think having someone come in and say, don't experiment with this is not a positive thing. I have a bit of contention with, with that saying, because I mean, I think FTX was a lot of publicity and I don't think that was good publicity. So basically every podcast in the world and every tweet thread has been talking about this. So I don't want to belabor the mechanics of it. I mean, it's really simple, basically. The government of Japan, Central Bank of Japan has kept interest rates really low for a long time. So if you wanted to borrow, you know, yen for basically zero for about 15 years or so, you could take it and invest it in other things that were earning a very high amount. It's like dollars right now earning roughly 5%. And everyone's doing this trade, you know, institutional investors, Japanese retail investors, a ton of people have been doing this trade. And then about two weeks ago, the Bank of Japan unexpectedly raised interest rates from 0.1% to 0.25%, which is by itself not a huge change, but it kind of signals a regime shift of what's happening there from the central bank. So all of a sudden, everyone went to unwind this thing at the same time, causing risk assets to plummet. I think there's a couple of things about it that were interesting to me that I didn't hear other podcasts talk about. So I'll just mention the first one is actually the more worrying one, which is that liquidity right now for financial assets is just terrible. 
Uh, I was messaging some of my friends who still work on the street, asking them about how is it that when, okay, the Nikkei was down something like 20% from, from the highs, S&P was down something like 10%. I think NASDAQ was down from at least intraday from the highs was down like 17%. I mean, massive moves. How is this happening? And my friends on the street are just saying, yeah, just liquidity is terrible. You know, liquidity is terrible in general, but also it's August. A lot of the risk takers on the street and but macro funds, they're on vacation. There's a bunch of interns manning the desk and liquidity hasn't gotten better since the Fed raised interest rates to 5%. What it did was it made me really worry that the next big type of risk off event we have, we can have a similar type of huge spike in the VIX or just a massive move in financial markets. So it's kind of scary. To me, it, it made me think maybe I need to move a little bit more of my own personal portfolio into stables. You know, in general, I try to keep something like 10 to 20% of my crypto portfolio in stables. I'm like, maybe I should move more like to 30 or 40%, you know, not, not financial advice. I'm just telling you what it made me think. Okay, that's the first thing. So liquidity right now is terrible and liquidity is not going to get better. Like the central bank is not going to be forced to make liquidity better unless there's a crash. The second thing is, and this is a bit more idiosyncratic to the Japanese market, um, the reason why... I heard the reason why Nikkei was down so bad was there's a bit of circular logic happening, which is that as soon as the yen carry trade starts to unwind, retail Japanese investors also unwind. So it's part of the reason why the Japanese stock market tanks. S&P and NASDAQ are down, as we were talking about earlier. And those things force Bitcoin to go down because Bitcoin is just levered S&P at this point. But then Bitcoin also has a huge impact on AI, which is also another speculative investment area right now. And the Nikkei actually has a significant amount of exposure to artificial intelligence. So <laughs> I guess last year, the Nikkei was up almost 30%. This year, up until the end of July, it was up another almost 30%. I think a big part of it was that AI had done so well. And now it's basically wiped out most of this year's gains. But Nikkei is still up something like 5% for the year. So I don't know, there's a bit of a circular logic happening here because Nikkei has a decent amount of artificial intelligence exposure. And maybe that's kind of an idiosyncratic thing about that market that caused the severity of the crash to be pretty high, but actually doesn't have a huge impact on like global financial markets. Bill, can you explain the, the Bitcoin exposure to AI? Yeah, I'm just saying that um, Bitcoin and AI are both like highly speculative investments, like very volatile and have been recently very successful, especially AI. There's a huge amount of correlation. Like when, any, when any of these crises happen, correlations kind of tend to one and all risk assets move together. And all I'm saying is the yen carry trade starts to unwind general stock markets like the Japanese stock market and the US stock market both tank. That means Nvidia and NASDAQ go down a lot. Bitcoin goes down a lot. And because Bitcoin goes down a lot, it causes people who are in both crypto and AI to kind of like freak out and dump everything. And so that forces AI to plummet. Okay, so then if AI is plummeting, then the Japanese stock market would also has a bunch of AI exposure and it also plummet. And do we know the size of the exposure to this unwinding? Like how big is this unwinding? Do you mean like in terms of how, how much more is left to unwind? Yeah. I've heard some estimates without details that we've got about 30% left, but it, you know, things seem to be calming down now. Hopefully Bitcoin is back up. Um, stock market in the US has kind of stabilized a bit. So hopefully it's more like 10% left. I don't know if anyone else is going to find this interesting, but it's kind of ironic that the, the Nikkei has been under its all-time high that was set in 1990, 34 years ago, that it finally started to sort of break above this year. And now it's crashed back down beneath that high again, down about 15%. Yeah, bubbles are scary, right? Yeah, let's not talk about that too much. Yeah. On the liquidity front, um, two quick thoughts. I think bad jobs report in the US and some of these uh, crazy things, I kind of wonder if that forces the Fed to start easing, could help the liquidity situation. And pure speculation, there's rumors jump has been kind of unwinding its market making business. In and of itself, that's not a huge amount of crypto being sold compared to other recent selling events, but it may have an outsized impact on liquidity. So maybe, you know, this like bad liquidity is even worse than crypto because a big market makers exiting. Um, I don't have any information on that. I just think, you know, it's possible that that's like caused a little bit of an amplified effect in crypto. 
Yeah, I don't have a sense for it. I, I've seen some rumors about Jump maybe selling because of regulatory pressure, but I've seen no concrete information. Like it could just be that they're putting on a trade, right? Like we have no idea. They could have something against the crypto side of their ETH sells where they're making money, you know, who, who knows what they're doing. Um, yeah, but they're getting out of market making. That's going to be terrible for crypto liquidity for sure. Let's move to this video that was highly critical of Solana uh, in general, but specifically the liquidity, the double counting, wash trading, and so on. I have been critical of Solana for a while. I think if you want to sort of put the best foot forward and get, you know, real support behind your blockchain, you want to have the best behavior that you can. And it seems like time and time again, this is my, going to be my personal opinion here, but it seems like they've presented one version of events and then it turns out to be something completely different. So they've been caught lying on numeral, like numerous things, numerous times. And when people call them out on it, they just blame the people for finding out that information. So first off, one of the earliest things would be that Solana made claims that their supply at the time of April, 2020, that their circulating supply was about 8.2 million tokens. And then some people discovered that the actual circulating supply was well over 20 million tokens. And then they had to come to terms with the fact that they had again, kind of lied about the real circulating supply. And then people again, realized that it turns out that they had loaned this to a number of influencers and market makers in order to try and create some pumping and hype in the market. They said that once they got found out that they would end up burning those 13 million tokens. And again, they said that they would do that. They never actually did that. So that is one big thing above that. Another of their really, really large claims was that they have this like super insane, really high transactions per second number. Their initial claims were stating that their TPS was approximately or above 400,000 TPS. And then it turns out that most of these transactions are actually consensus messages, which no other blockchain tracks. And when you actually break it down and you look at out of all of those supposed TPS, what is taking place is like actual user transactions. And it turns out that well less, like well under 10% of those 400,000 transactions are actual real transactions. And then furthermore, a large number of those transactions are actually facilitated by bots. And it's facilitated by bots because their cost of transactions is so low that they're able to try and keep that number high by incentivizing these bots to do other things like sending back worthless tokens back and forth to each other really, really, really fast. The next point would be that again, early on, they claimed to have a bunch of numbers very high in the potential hundreds of millions, I think about how much TVL that they had in terms of actual like DeFi activity. And it turns out that over 70% of that TVL was fake. This was the result of two developers who were kind of in cahoots to create these multiple DeFi protocols. And it was these two developers who were pretending to be over 10 developers. And essentially they would like take a dollar, they would multiply it many, many, many times over to the point where the majority of the TVL on the entire chain was actually just these two developers borrowing and lending the same, the same couple hundred thousand dollars over and over and over again, until it got into like the high multiple millions, tens, if not hundreds. There's another kind of scandal on their TVL numbers where somebody had, this might be related to the same people. I'm not exactly sure, but there were claims that there were two NFTs or some kind of tokens that were accounting for like $250 million of their TVL. And they were essentially worthless. They were just printed. They had, again, some kind of fake volume kind of backing those numbers in order to make it look like they were really, really big. And they were not. On the centralized exchange side of things and also on their actual DEXs, they report having really high transaction volumes and trading volumes. Again, when people look into that, it turns out that 90% of that is wash trading. And when you remove, I think, two stable coins from their actual uh, trading volumes, it, the, the number of the trading volumes drops down by like 95%. So they report 30 million 
monthly unique users on the blockchain, but this, for some reason, like this is their official number and it happens to include bots running transactions on the chain, as well as any number of additional wallets a single user may have. So, I mean, I know that for a fact that I have multiple wallets from Solana's perspective, I could be eight people if I have like eight different wallet addresses under the same kind of wallet software. So this is all from that recent video that a gentleman posted and kind of went through all these claims. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I remember seeing some of this stuff detailed in previous years, like the Genesis tokens, you know, being, you know, whatever, some confusion about the Genesis tokens and the TPS numbers are all, everyone knows that those are nonsense. And I didn't realize that the TVL shenanigans are that bad, but I mean, you look up on Dex Screener right now, it's, by default, Dex Screener will show you the most active trading pairs and it's not Ethereum, it's not any other chain, it's just Solana, it's like all Solana. So from my point of view, even if they're doing a lot of these sh shenanigans to make their numbers look really good, on the flip side, I feel like they're definitely getting some stuff right. If you go to conferences, I mean, I'm sure you guys go to conferences, right? Like you go to any random blockchains conference, it's like 20% attendance. You go to a Solana blockchain event, like, a, like at, a, at a major venue with like hundreds and hundreds of seats and all the Solana seats are just packed. It's crazy. So that somehow they're still getting a bunch of the young developer, trader, builder energy there. I, even at local meetup events here in New York, like when I sit down and talk with people, like but the vast majority of people are just trading Solana meme coins. Like that's what everyone's doing. And I do have to give a shout out to one of my favorite assets in DeFi, which is JLP, which is like the Solana version of GLP. It's just like this almost in a straight line up asset. It's like half stable coins, half Solana and Bitcoin and Ethereum. And in the recent market turmoil, it had like just a 5% drawdown and it's back to the all time high. So there's a lot of good stuff happening on Solana. It's like one of these things where, you know, they're, some, not everyone, but some people are definitely dressing up the chain to make it look really nice, but then yeah. maybe it's actually attracting real energy to the chain. So I don't know what to make of it. I use the chain. I like it. I don't put a tremendous amount of TBL on it because I'm worried that it's going to go down for a significant amount of time. But how do you guys feel about it? So I understand that there, like, there's obviously some good things that are happening on Solana that can't be taken away from them. However, my main point of contention with that is if we look at the way that FTX was going before the big crash at FTX, right? It was just one big never ending party and people were making a lot of money and people were really enthusiastic and the attendance for whatever they were doing was super high, but that essentially came from the amount of profit they were able to make because they were running a fraudulent business. I'm not going to make like super inflammatory claims. But I think when you look at some of the more real things that are actually happening, one of those would be the fact that the, the founders of Solana actually endorse very harmful MEV to occur on their chain to the point where actual users are getting sandwiched attacked and losing significant sums of money because the way that MEV is working on their chain, they they essentially have no problem with, with this running. There's actually a, a snippet of an interview with, uh, I don't remember who it was. I think it might've been somebody from Jito, but they were talking about how they're able to make these huge profits on MEV, but they tend to leave out the fact that they're doing this because they're able to get significantly large sandwich tax on people's trades. And on top of that, just the fact that like their inflation numbers are really high. They're minting something like 10 million tokens a day. I understand that there's a lot of enthusiasm behind it. There's a lot of people who are legitimate, well-intentioned, whether they're developers or community members. However, I think that that just is generally going to happen when there's money to be made and people are really hyped up about the potential profits that could come out of this chain. You don't mean 10 million Solana tokens a day, you mean some other coin, right? The stat that I have is that they're minting 10 million Solana tokens a day. That's okay. I don't know if that's accurate. Maybe it's 10 million worth of Solana tokens a day. All right. All right. I'll leave that alone because I haven't done the research. There's some good places to look at comparative inflation. Most earlier networks have positive inflation. Bitcoins is quite low. Ethereum tends to be negative. Most others have positive inflation. That aspect is like, at least part of that is kind of just the life cycle of a blockchain. Inflation will start higher at first. A couple of thoughts. One, I think 
so Polly Naya has talked a lot about like the what, what he or she calls the trilemma of highly scalable blockchains. And so it's pick two of low cost, low spam, and censorship resistant. I think that's part of where you see a lot of spam transactions here with bots. Not all bot activity is bad. A lot of bot activity is good. Some types of MEV are good, like StatArb, et cetera. And you want bots doing that. But if it's super, super low cost to transact and you aren't blacklisting people and censoring, you're going to have a ton of spam. My view has been that Solana would probably be better off if they allowed transaction fees to go up more during congestion times. Like the difference in UX between a penny transaction and a 0.001 penny transaction is not really much different for most people. And so allowing transaction fees to go up a little bit more would help with some of that. So I, I think that's kind of a manifestation of, of that trilemma that's just hard to get around. I think the last thing that I would say is that there is also an aspect of centralization where one of the other claims that they had made early on was that they're decentralized and you can, I guess, run nodes on this chain if you wanted to. But it turns out they actually have a very, I don't know if it's a centralized sequencer or if it is just, it's basically like a server or a node that's running a significant portion of these transactions and allowing them to occur really fast. And that's basically owned by the blockchain. It's not owned by any individuals. Yeah. So decentralization is a a good topic and there's, I think, different ways to measure it. I think they definitely have, Solana definitely has less decentralization than like Ethereum, for example. There's some trade-offs there. One other point to make about wash trading and double counting of addresses, et cetera, to some extent that happens on almost every chain. It's it's just hard to identify how many truly unique users there are. Some chains probably do some of these things more than others. Some chains are going to have more kind of boosted TVL numbers than others because some foundations will deploy their own assets on their chain or do certain things to incentivize usage and others won't. Most do. I think the Ethereum foundation is really probably the only one that doesn't do anything. So truly comparing these can be hard. I think as someone who loves fundamentals, I think this is a good example of, of why you probably want to look at lots of different measures. So daily DEX volume, but you want to account for certain factors. Like are there some really thin liquidity pools that there's evidence of wash trading, maybe exclude those. Another thing you can look at is just LP fees instead of actual volume. That's like a way to kind of rationalize it a little bit. TVL of very specific type of assets can be helpful. So if you look at stablecoin TVL across chains, some people would be surprised that TVL of stable coins on like Tron, for instance, is enormously high and it's used a ton for real world transactions. And most Westerners don't hear a lot about Tron. On Solana, it stayed pretty flat. So that's like one interesting measure. I think to, to kind of triangulate, you want to look at a lot of these things. I think if you look at all of the different measures for Solana, my sense is that Solana usage is truly increasing, but it may not be increasing by as much as it appears compared to some of their peers. So I think to Bill's point, there are more people that I know that use Solana than used to. It's definitely um, got some good builders. Like my perception is that both the Jito and the Jupiter teams are like pretty solid teams, but the, some of these numbers aren't always directly comparable. And so that's, I think one thing that you can fall into a big trap is if you just you just look at only one measure and then, you know, choose the measure that really favors your blockchain, it'll end up giving you a really distorted view of where the real economic activity is happening. Yeah, I'd say just one of one of the issues that kind of rubs me the wrong way is it seems like part of their marketing strategy is to include some of these claims that are like obviously false. And they don't make a very large effort to try and fact check their own claims when they're making them. And then when people call them out on, on saying like, hey, you're saying that you do this many transactions, well, then they're going to snap back and call that user stupid for implying that their TPS is fake. Or if their TVL numbers are kind of faked, they'll just start blocking people and removing them from their tweets. So I think there, there's definitely a real community there and it is growing. It's just concerning when you see them getting behind some of these obviously false claims and then 
not doing anything when people are actually trying to like criticize them for it. I think that's something that probably all of Twitter can do better at and some communities better than others where there's this like excessive toxicity and tribalism, unfortunately. Vitalik's always been a hero to me in that there's a famous interview he did or as a debate between him and Samson Mao in probably 2020. And Samson just spent the whole interview like aggressively attacking and insulting. And Vitalik just stayed calm and just in a lot of cases was like, yeah, it's a fair critique and here's why we did that. But here's you know why we chose what we chose. That's pretty rare and it's unfortunate. I've even found that like you can post something on X that's like, you, you know, people, it's not a super spicy take, but people disagree and people will, you know, yell at you and unfollow you and all these things. And I, I tend to think that it's really healthy to have thoughtful disagreement. I wish people were able to do that a little bit better. <laughs> so I think all of crypto Twitter is a little bit underperforming in that regard, some communities more than others, for sure. Yeah, I'll agree with that. I'll be fair because I know for a fact that it's true that everybody does this. There's probably going to be, let's say there's some avalanche people who or avalanche maxis who listen to this and some of them are going to be like, yeah, Solana sucks. And that's not what I'm saying, right? But but yeah, everybody has those maxi people who they don't like to hear bad things about the thing that they like. And that's true for every community. My criticism of TradFi is that there's a complete lack of innovation. But when information is presented in TradFi today, and yeah, this is thanks to the insane amount of regulations that are in the space, but information is presented in a certain way that is uh, generally accurate and financial statements for all their faults are, are done in, in a sort of accurate manner. And you know, stepping into DeFi, which I love because there's no restriction on innovation. I think the one sort of barrier to moving forward is just the large and frankly insane amount of bad behavior in the space that we've seen time and time again. And personally, I'm, I get very uncomfortable when there's any sort of project where there's red flags and the founders of that project are not out in front sort of setting the example and saying, hey, this is not how we want to present this. This is not how we want to do this. And I, I will leave any community as soon as I see sort of that, that kind of behavior. And I, I will stay away from projects. I would prefer to just not invest in projects that um, have those red flags. And it, it does seem like from what I've seen that Solana sort of is, is not doing a great job on this front. And I think culture, and I, I appreciate what Rhett, you, you said about uh, Vitalik. And I, I think that's one thing I really like about Ethereum is that there is that approach and carefulness to do things a certain way. And you don't see that across crypto. And it's, I think, a major problem that we all have to call out and fight against. Yeah, it's not to just go off on Ethereum, but an interesting similar example of that in the Ethereum community is this last week, uh, a guy named Peter, who's an ETH core developer. I think he's like the lead of the Geth team, wrote a big thread saying he wonders if we're building anything useful in crypto. And he's like, am I in the wrong industry? And there's like a good, healthy debate there, but that was something that in some communities would be really off limits to say anything negative about your blockchain, especially. So I think that's healthy. There could be more of it in more places for sure. To give a positive counterexample of Solana, in 2021, I tweeted something about how Solana was kind of didn't give retail an opportunity to get in early. Uh, a lot of it was bought by VC and they were like, look, we needed the money and VCs were giving us the money. What are we supposed to do? And I said, well, you just didn't give retail a chance. And then they posted a link to here was our public sale that retail could have participated in before their big VC raises. And I was like, okay, you're right. I was wrong. <laughs> and you did give them a chance. And I either didn't know or forgot about that. And they were actually really gracious about it. And that was um, their two uh, main guys, Anatolian Raj, and actually thought it was a pretty positive interaction. So I've seen some pretty positive stuff there, at least in that interaction. I'm not obviously interacting with them regularly, but I haven't found it all in one direction, put it that way. I think this is a good mark to end the show uh, on a positive note. Thank you everyone for watching. I appreciate the views. Please subscribe to our channel and uh, I'll see you guys have final fighting thoughts. Thank you to our 10 viewers. We appreciate you guys. <laughs> Yeah, we love the 10 viewers. Comment below if you love or you hate Solana. I don't think there's anywhere in between. I enjoy the chats even if no one views. So yeah, thanks. <laughs>